Welcome to the ITU studio in Geneva, where we're here for the Future Networked Car Symposium being held at ITU today. And I'm joined in the studio by Michael Senna, who is the editor of The Dispatcher. Michael, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, a lot of big discussions and conversations going on here at the symposium. What have been the major themes of discussion at this year's symposium? And, and is there perhaps a topic that stands out as, as this year's hottest topic? Yes, well, the topics are very similar to the topics that we've had for the last few years. Um, and the reason that we've continued to have topics such as AI, cybersecurity, legislation, policies, is because those continue to be very important topics for everyone involved, for the tele telecommunications, for the vehicle manufacturers, and for everyone involved in regulatory issues. Is there a particular one that's, uh, that's come to the fore? Well, as, as the moderator for the session on cybersecurity, I have to say that that was a very important and continues to be a very important topic uh, for many, many reasons. Because um, I think we all understand that if we're not secure in our communications from the vehicles, if we don't allow the information that's necessary to be used for further automation of our driving, we're not going to use it. We're not going to be, uh, we're not going to feel safe, we're not going to feel secure, and the fact is that we won't be. Most people think about cybersecurity when they're thinking about cybersecurity, they're thinking about their computers at home or their laptops or their phones. Yep. So let's talk, I mean, I'd like to expand a little bit on this. So let's talk about a little bit about cybersecurity. What should we be thinking about uh, in the, the latest uh, cars? The main problems that we have when, when it comes to cybersecurity versus in, in our uh, phones and in our in, uh, PCs, people who are attacking our our telecommunications devices, com enabled devices, are doing it primarily to, to make money. I mean, they're thieves, they want something, and they'll, they'll do it one way or the other. Either they'll, they'll put something in your, your computer so that you can't use it in order f before that you pay them. I think it's going to be difficult to uh, attack that same problem and do it in the same way with vehicles. With vehicles, we have a much more difficult problem. Mobile phones are in our hand. PCs are normally on, a, on our laptop or a, on a desk, but with vehicles we have many more issues to, to address primarily from the standpoint of, of safety. Cars can be hijacked in order to, to earn money, but something else can happen when that's, that's uh, occurring that creates a, an unsafe situation for the driver and, and people around. I mean, we can start driving cars without drivers into lots of people and many people can be injured. So I don't think it's the same issue of being paid money. It could be terrorists, primarily terrorist attacks, or individuals who are, are acting as, as terrorists, not political terrorists, but as, as terrorists from, a, from another st uh, standpoint. If you were a consumer, if you were sitting at home, you could uh, perhaps take steps a against this. Of course, if you're, you're driving a car, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different story. How can consumers protect themselves, mitigate themselves against these circumstances? If, if the vehicle has been designed in such a way that it's open to attack, that someone can take control of that vehicle, there's nothing you can do as a driver. You have absolutely no control of what's going on in internally in a vehicle. That's a very different situation than, you can't pull the plug out. If you're driving the car, even if you turn the key off, y the, the car is still moving. If someone has taken control of the car, you have absolutely nothing to do with it. So it's a, it's a very different situation. That's why we're taking such, long, such a long time and great care before we turn over any of the driving tasks to a non-human. So is ICU, UNECE, are they contributing to the, this, uh, this conversation? Tell us a little bit about uh, yeah, the steps a, that are being taken. Yeah, it's immense. Before I began working with, with the ITU, uh, which was in 2015, I produced a report on, on over-the-air updates requirements, uh, functional and, and operational requirements. Um, I had been working around the issues of telecommunications with, with uh, e-call, b-call, those sorts of things since 1997. Um, but the whole issue of cybersecurity had not been part of it in the, in the same way because our communications, I was working with, with, uh, with Volvo at the time, um, our communications were, were secure one to one. There was no involvement of the internet. There was no. It was a. It was a. It was a data packet going over SMS, and everything that we did was extremely secure. But as as the years went on, and we became more and more dependent on, on IP, on inter internet uh, uh, communications, uh, 
cybersecurity became much more important. And then, when we began to think about the whole idea of over-the-air updating, it became even more important. Once you, once you allow the vehicle to be communicated with in, in many different situations, you have to be much more concerned with, with uh, over-the-air, with uh, cybersecurity. And at that time, the ITU was almost alone in developing the, the standards. I mean, the, the, the work, the WP29 and the SG17, these groups are doing an enormous amount of work. And, and now, finally, the, the, the standards are published. It's fantastic. In your work with the automotive industry, what is the challenge brought up most often in discussions around intelligent transport and innovation? Uh, you know, it's 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 almost like what what's you know what what did they say in the newspaper yesterday? Um, I watched the industry very very closely, and five years ago there wasn't a single um, CEO of a company that was really seriously talking about uh, electrification, except for Elon Musk, um, and everyone thought that it was he was a crack and that there was no one you know no one was going to be developing cars. Uh, Sergio Marchionne, a few years ago, a few years before he died, uh, said, please don't buy my electric cars. They cost me more money to sell them to you than, it, than, than uh, you pay me to, to own one. So, s but suddenly electrification is, is on everybody's, in everyone's thoughts and in their minds. Communications, the, if, you, if you mention communications to a CEO, it's, it's almost as if they're, they don't really want to talk about it because, because com connected cars have never sold cars. They've never, you know, it's not something that you, you walk into a, to a um, place to buy a, a, a dealer, say, you know, I want the most connected car. It, it's on the list, it's things, something you think about, but it's, it's the cost, it's the space that you get, it's the, you know, it's what you can afford, the best car you can afford for the money, the size, the quality, and so on, and then the image that you, you don't, tr you don't walk into a BMW dealer if you can't afford a BMW, or if somehow you can manage to pay the monthly rents on a, on a lease. Um, so the things that we think about, the things that we're working on, are really not, they're not top of the list for the folks who are running these companies. They look at, how am I going to sell the most cars? What's going to, what am I going to be able to put in my cars that makes them sell? And now, because everything is, is be, the governments have gotten behind it, good or not, I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of, of electrification um, for many reasons, not the least of which is that we, we don't save that much energy and pollute less with, en with electric cars. Uh, but now, because there's so much th so many thoughts and so many regulations and we have plus and minus and so on for, and for insurance, people are now talking about electric cars. Um, when we get to the point of cars actually being able to do more than they can do as far as self-driving, the car companies will begin to put more thought into it. They're putting money into it. They're, they're actually putting a lot of money. But a couple of years ago, it was much more on the top of the list. Now it's much more on the sort of middle to bottom of the list. It's not, it's not the highest priority anymore because it's gotten too hard. They realize that it's not going to happen tomorrow, and it, we're not going to sell cars because of it. Because of regulation? Because, well, because the, it doesn't work yet. I mean, it doesn't, the, the, the self-driving cars are not self-driving, and even if Elon Musk thinks he's selling cars because of that, he's selling cars because, especially in Norway, because people can't afford to buy anything else. They get so many rebates and so many, so many kickbacks that think, you know, they can't afford not to buy a Tesla. And what about uh, the future of mobility? What are your predictions for the future of mobility? And, and how are regulators thinking about it? How are industry players thinking about it? And, and what should we expect as consumers? Um, not everybody lives in San Francisco. Not everybody lives in the middle of London. I've never lived in San Francisco, but I did live in the middle of, of London. Um, I have an apart we have an apartment in, in uh, Stockholm. We don't live there full time, but we do get an opportunity to spend time in the, in the middle, the real middle of the largest city in Sweden, um, or sc even Scandinavia. It's a very different proposition than living in a small city, a small town, 80 kilometers west of, of uh, Stockholm, or living in a, in a small village in the north of, of uh, Sweden. Even in our conference today, there wasn't any mention of the fact that 
in, in a place like a country like the United States, where 50% of the people live in two c on two coasts and with a little dot in the middle ch in Chicago, but the rest of the folks live on 90% of the land in the rest of the country. Those 50% of the people aren't riding scooters. They're not riding bicycles to the supermarket. They're driving cars. So the, the issue that car companies have today, and it's the issue that transportation people have, f who if, if you're dealing with transportation in an entire country, how do you manage to provide the mobility to all the people in different situations, not just to all the people living in the center of Stockholm, not to mention the fact that, that Stockholm, people think of Stockholm is urbanizing. It actually isn't. It's, it's getting better, bigger. People are moving into the Stockholm region, but they're not moving into the center of, center of Stockholm. This, the same is true of most cities. We have to, to accommodate people being able to move from all parts and all different types of densities within a region. And right now, we're not addressing that to the, t to the extent that I feel we need to. Now you've taken the time to be here at this symposium. It was originally going to be at the uh, the Geneva Car Show, but we you know, for, for the reasons uh, uh, of um, uh, health uh, that uh, it was cancelled here in Switzerland. But uh, I wanted to ask you, what's the value of this symposium to you and to the wider intelligent transport community? I tell the readers of my newsletter, The Dispatcher, that if there's one conference that they should attend, if they're, if they're in the transport business, if they're in the telecommunications business related to transport, if there's one conference that they should attend, it's this one. Because unlike many of the other conferences, many of them are, are much larger, they have exhibitions, they have a lot of people standing up talking about what their company is doing. This is devoted to the principal issues that we're all addressing. And everyone gets to hear everything at the same time there's participation. If you've got a question, and you can ask, you can ask it during the session, or you can ask it during a, a break, whether lunch break, or you sit down with all the people who were there. Now we have approximately 50 people in the audience today because people, you know, haven't been able to come. Not all the moderators, uh, not all of the the panelists, uh, have been able to uh, to travel to Geneva either. More joining remotely then. And but joining remotely, and that's that was fantastic. That's absolutely great. But when you come to this this event, you're able to talk with anyone, anytime. And that's, that's a major benefit. And it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's a per person coming from the commission or from a car company, you, th with the number of people that you have all together for an entire day, from nine o'clock until seven or eight o'clock this evening, you have the full avail availability of them, and that's a fantastic opportunity. Michael Senna, uh, editor of The Dispatcher, thank you very much for making yourself available to us here in the ITU studio and uh, hopefully we'll catch up with you again at some stage in the near future and, uh, and you can share some more valuable insights with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.